Hello everybody and welcome to this evening's event. My name's Chris Brown and I'm here on behalf of Pluto Press. Um, I'll be handing over to our chair for tonight, Ramsey Baroud, in just a minute. But um, before we get started properly, I just wanted to sort of share a quick note on structure, basically. Uh, so there is going to be a Q&A as part of our event this evening. So if during the course of the discussion you have a question that you'd like to put to any of our panellists, then all you need to do is just write it down in the YouTube live chat and I'll be forwarding that on to them. Um, secondly, if you haven't already seen it, Pluto has put together a special reading list to accompany this live stream, and it features books from our panelists as well as other authors, and you can browse that list of books uh, on plutobooks.com and find out more there. Uh, okay, so that's it, just some housekeeping really. So I'm going to say a preemptive thank you to all of our panelists for taking part today, and also to you all for tuning in as well. Uh, so without further ado, I'm now going to hand over to Ramsey to get us underway properly. I thank you very much, Chris, and I thanks uh, everyone for joining us and welcome to NECBA 75, Pluto's Voices of Palestine, organized by Pluto Press. I know many of you already know this, but Pluto Press is one of the world's leading progressive publishers and indeed one of the top publishers on Palestine as well. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, it's important to denote the following. The Nakba is not an event that can be or should be assigned to history books. Rather, it's an ongoing catastrophe expressed on a daily basis through the suffering of millions of stateless Palestinian refugees uh, uh, in Palestine itself, but also Lebanon, Syria, Iraq, and the rest of the world. The ongoing Israeli violence, the military occupation of Palestine, the racist apartheid regime, and the constant Israeli Zionist attempts at uh, the very erasure, not only of the Nakba, but of Palestinian memory and identity as well. To discuss these topics and more, we have four excellent speakers with us today. We were meant to be joined by uh, Diana Alan, who unfortunately could not be with us today uh, due to circumstances. Um, out of her control. I will introduce our speakers one by one before their immediate intervention so that we may save time. And as Chris mentioned earlier, we have a Q&A period towards the end of this session. Our first speaker is Professor Gada Karmi. Uh, Professor Karmi is gonna be speaking for about 10 minutes uh, and each one of the speakers will speak for about 10 minutes. And then from that point on, we will focus on the Q&A. Professor Ghada Karmi is a Palestinian physician, academic, and a writer. She is a former research fellow at the Institute of Arab and Islamic Studies at the University of Exeter. Her books include an accl uh, her an acc uh, uh, acclaimed memoir, In Search for Fatima, a Palestinian story, Married to Another Man, Israel's Dilemma in Palestine, which I believe uh, is published by Pluto Press, and her second memoir, Return. Uh, Professor Karmi, uh, as a well-known scholar on the subject, um, how did the relationship between academic institutions and the Nakba change throughout the years? And, and when I say academic institutions, I'm mostly talking about Western academic institutions, of course, uh, throughout the years, and what it needs to be done to accentuate the Palestinian narrative through academia and other platforms. Please feel free to touch on this, address this, or uh, talk about any other issues that you find uh, of greater urgency in your 10 minutes. Uh, Dr. Karmi, the floor is yours. Thank you. Um, it's very, very nice to be, uh, to be here talking about a very important event in the Palestinian calendar. Now, uh, I am one of a dwindling number of Palestinians who was alive at the time of the Nakba, and I remember certain things. I was a child, but um, I lived through 1948 and the subsequent events which followed the loss of Palestine. Um, you know, it's it's one of those tragedies where people talk about it quite often as if it was in the past, but it's not, it's ongoing, it's with us today. Uh, and um, 
it's in the nature of the um, uh, the conflict with Israel that it would continue to be with us because of the nature actually of the Israeli state and um, its ideology and its ongoing abuses of the Palestinian people. Now, I do want to inject, first of all, a note of optimism in all this. Um, and believe it or not, there really is uh, a chink of light because uh, for the first time, the United Nations has commenced the uh, commemoration of the Nakba. That's the first time that has ever happened. And the Nakba has been um, noted uh, and been commemorated in many major cities in Britain. Um, and it has become so much of uh, a household word that even a British program, which is called um, um, University Challenge, which is a quiz program with young people from various universities who compete to, for general knowledge. The most recent episode of this program had a question on the Nakba. <laughs> and not only that, but the student who was being questioned knew the answer. So, there is some progress. However, uh, back to the situation. Well, um, living in the England that I lived through soon after we left, we were forced to leave our homeland, living in that London at the time and growing up in that London, no one actually acknowledged Palestinian, not only suffering, but even the Palestinian version of events, only Israel and its um, spokespeople, they were the only acceptable voice on the Middle East. Um, this was very painful. And um, uh, the, I, I, I remember going through times when I, th I felt desperate. I thought this is never going to change. And nobody is going to be listening to us or hearing from us or wants to know anything about us. However, it's very good to recall that this changed. It changed um, for the better and increasingly so in the last 30 years. Um, more awareness of Palestine, more and more support for Palestinians, and more and more solidarity with Palestinians uh, in Britain, which is really very, very important for us. At the same time, the situation in academic institutions in Britain has been pretty variable. Uh, some universities are notable by their exception to the rule. The rule being that Palestine um, was a sensitive subject, quote, sensitive subject, and that there was always a fear, which has become much, much greater these days, a fear that Jews might be offended, and later that the state of Israel might be offended. And um, I, I regret very much that even those universities which used to be sympathetic to Palestinians, used to give a platform for the Palestinian voice, used to encourage teaching about the so-called Israeli-Palestinian conflict from a Palestinian point of view. And I have personal experience of that because that's what I taught at the University of Exeter for, for 10 years. That has changed. Uh, that has changed. And um, the fear of uh, being labeled as anti-Semitic, which is a very important weapon in the possession of Israel and its friends, has served its purpose. It has intimidated academic centers from allowing the Palestinian voice to be heard. More and more and more, we are being silenced. Now, we have to fight this. We have to fight it. We have to harness 
the energies of popular support for Israel, which is real and is happening every day at the popular level in Britain, in the United States, and in other European countries. We have to harness that energy and that voice to affect and influence the situation in academia. They need to be encouraged. We need to be unafraid when we put out our message and we need to encourage them to be unafraid. And the more we do that, I think the more we will succeed. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Karmi, and uh, uh, particularly on the, you know, the positive note, I mean, sometimes I feel, you know, that uh, perhaps young people, young scholars who have every right to be um, uh, demanding and, and obsessively so regarding the, you know, fairness in, in Western academia, um, how, you know, much things actually have changed from uh, 30 years ago plus compared to what is happening right now. So there is a lot to be optimistic about. And, and I'm going to move to my second speaker here, and that's uh, Dr. Um, Akram Salhab. Uh, uh, Akram Salhab is a PhD student in politics at Queen Mary University of London, focusing mostly on Palestinian history, sovereignty, and anti-colonialism. Um, Akram, Zionism is a colonial experience rooted in Western colonialism. What are the proper tools to challenge the Zionist attempt at Nakba erasure, keeping in mind that in many ways, Western academia contributed to the erasure of the Nakba as well? I know that this ties up to uh, the uh, question and the issues raised by uh, Professor Karmi. If you could elaborate on that from your point of view, that would be great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ramzi, and thank you, uh, Pluto, for organizing this uh, really wonderful event. Um, and it's very important, of course, on Nakba Day, and wonderful to be with you all, uh, new friends and old friends alike, to commemorate and to raise awareness about these historical crimes. And I think uh, anyone who's met any Palestinian will know that the Nakba is the defining event in our national life. Um, and that, of course, is not always reflected in the kinds of discourse we see about Palestine, the kind of things that people um, discuss when it comes to the kinds of solutions that Palestinians seek, you know, hear about Palestinian statehood more than we might hear about the right of return. But for Palestinians, the, the Nakba is the defining moment in our national life. I remember when I was preparing for this talk and thinking about what, what I wanted to say, in uh, 2008, we were commemorating the 60th uh, year of the Nakba. And uh, it's difficult to imagine now that it's 75 years since the Nakba. And one of the first things that we learn about when we learn about the Nakba is that Palestinian refugees did not expect to be gone from their homes more than a number of weeks or for a number of months, but that slowly the growing awareness that, that the expulsion from their homes wasn't temporary, that it was going to be long term, began this realization that um, uh, really the fate we had suffered was not some accidental thing that the international community was going to solve, but was the concerted effort of the Zionist movement who, um, for whom the idea of transferring Palestinians was very well embedded in their conferences and their public discussions. But from especially the Arab revolt onwards, became much more focused on this idea of forcible transfer and forcibly expelling Palestinians from their homes. And the Nakba they saw as the big opportunity to, ex to expel a large number of Palestinians. Um, and they did this in two principal ways. One is surrounding and conquering Palestinian towns and villages and forcibly expelling people at gunpoint. And the other was committing strategic massacres and if you look, if you take a map of Palestine and you look at where all the massacres took place, the massacres took place in different areas around the country. They would attack villages from three sides with the uh, fourth side open to the nearest border in order to induce Palestinian flight in that direction. And of course, in the north, they even they named it as such the whispering campaign in order to spread fear and to encourage Palestinians to flee. 
So this was a conscious uh, decision that was taken to rid Palestinian of its inhabitants. And I think it's very difficult for all of us who have lived this history, who know this history, who have people affected by it, uh, Dr. Rada, who lived through it herself, to rehearse these ideas of numbers, to rehearse this um, very clear intentionality on behalf of the Zionist movement, that all that doesn't always relay the gravity of what Palestinians know that they have lost. It wasn't just that Palestinians were forced from their homes, that those homes were then destroyed, that the entire society was destroyed, that the schools and the educational institutions, the crops, the land, that when Palestinians tried to return to that land, uh, you know, trying to cross just to harvest their crops sometimes, they would be shot. 5,000 Palestinians were shot at borders trying to come back to their homes. It wasn't an accident they were they were expelled and that they just weren't allowed back, it just didn't happen. They were forced to be prevented from returning to their homes. Other Palestinians who were, made it across were rounded up, put on buses and deported for a second time. So, so I think we talk about these facts, but it's difficult to really understand the gravity of um, what what the Nakba meant and continues to mean to Palestinians. And I think if you look at Palestinian literature, you see how how it ruptured our life in such a significant way. I'm Palestinian from Jerusalem, so um, whenever I'm home, as I am at the moment, uh, you can go and you can see Palestinian villages. You can visit them. You can walk amongst their ruins. This eerie, haunting sense of an, a life around you that's been completely destroyed. If you look at the Palestinian communities in '48, the idea that half their na- the majority of their neighbors were no longer there, the, the the fact that their life had been completely upended, the the people they worked with, they traded with, their friends, their family were suddenly cast to the four corners of the earth. For Palestinian refugees who ended up in refugee camps the second highest mortality rate in the world in the 1950s and had and created from that uh, an extraordinary revolution that was part of a global revolution known as the third worldist movement but that the, the, that's what we've lived through is what the reality of the nakba means today and it's really in our bones and it's in our understanding of our history and our understanding of the world in extremely profound ways and that's why every year we commemorate the Nakba, but it's also a reminder of us, uh, it's a reminder to us of th- what lies at the heart of the Palestinian struggle for liberation, which is the right of return of Palestinian refugees to their homes. No large, no constituent of Palestinian exists or has ever, exist, ever existed that is willing to stand down on the right of return. It's the core um, struggle that we, that we uh, so it's a core objective of the Palestinian national struggle. It has been, and it will continue to be. And I think the advocates and supporters of Palestine, many of whom I hope are joining us today on the call, uh, will have to keep that front and center. The Palestinians are not unique in suffering colonial tragedies in the world. There are many peoples in our region and further afield who've also experienced the brutality and complicity of Britain uh, in sponsoring and supporting those criminal acts. Um, but, uh, you know, many other societies and many other communities have done as well. And British society is structured on the denial of those crimes. And it's structured on the, even if it does talk about those crimes, mentioning them in passing, talking about them in very broad terms, in very inhumane terms. This film that came out on... Um, uh, about the Nakba and about the the young woman witnessing crimes being committed against her family. That's one of the few occasions you actually see the violence of what happens to Palestinians. We talk about the British mandate in Palestine, the second biggest um, military deployment of the British Empire, and suppressing the the, uh, the 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 Palestinian revolt, the Great Arab Revolt. They committed the most heinous crimes, but these are not these are hidden. They are not they're not made public. And I think one of the things that we need to do when we talk about Palestinian history is not just talk about the Nakba in a very general term, but to detail the crimes that constituted it, to talk about the violence that was meted against, meted against Palestinians, to talk about in the context of British Britain's unrecognized colonial history and the debt that it still owes 
to Palestinians to make that right, to um, to change its policy to support the Palestinian liberation. These are all obviously very far fetched, but we have to continue to st struggle for them nonetheless. So I think um, that's that's what as commemorating the Nakba means: recentering what matters to Palestinians, recentering the core demands of our national struggle, and making sure that in everything we do that. Uh, features front and center um and that's all i have to say for now i don't know how i'm doing for time Ramzi. Uh, that was brilliant uh thanks thanks very much uh dr salahab for this another profound and beautiful palestinian voice uh you mentioned the the fact that many of the fellahin many of the refugees were under the impression and they had every right to to, to believe that way back then that they are going to come back in a few weeks and there's always this famous story in my family about my parents or rather my grandparents who had this fight over should we take the old blankets or the new blankets on our journey as they were being expelled out of Palestine and then you know grandpa wanted to take the old blankets because he did not want the new ones to get dusty and dirty in the journey knowing that they are going to come back in few days, our Arab brethren and the world is not going to allow this injustice to continue, uh, was his thought. And, and sadly, he was proven wrong uh, at the time. Uh, our third speaker is Dr. Mizna Qatu. Uh, Dr. Qatu is a historian of the modern Middle East and, in, uh, and where she uh, emphasizes uh, education, migration, development, and Palestinian refugee and exile communities. Uh, Dr. Katu, while the Middle East is not stranger to collective refugee traumas, how does the Palestinian Nakba experience differ from these other experiences, if it does, uh, from the rest of the uh, modern history of the Middle East compared to, for example, the refugees and the exile of refugees during the First and Second Iraq War, Syria, Libya, um, and now Sudan, of course, uh, and Yemen, among others. Um, thank you so much, Pluto. Thank you so much, Ramzi, um, for that introduction and for your question. Um, I'll get to the problem and the challenge and the dangers of difference and differentiation in a minute. But I want to directly answer your question. How is it different? Well, in a way, I think what makes Palestine different is that it was the canary in the coal mine, that the Palestinian experience of expulsion, dispossession, um, um, settler colonialism, colonial um, extraction, all of these things in one form or another predate or prefigure um, the experiences and conditions that have emerged afterwards, but also sometimes alongside the Palestinian experience. Um, I work on education, so I'll give an example about education. The Palestinian ex um, experience of their educational life after expulsion, in particular the way the logic of that system for Palestinian refugees, for example, that Palestinians cannot teach their own curriculum, that the you know, UN schools are developed for particular purposes of resettlement rather than return. Um, the, the structure and hierarchy uh, embedded within that system um, and the purposes of that system have come to define the educational experience of, popu of stateless populations and communities around the world. It was precisely the Palestinian experience that shaped the way stateless uh, populations and communities um, uh, and refugees have now had to contend with the oppressive experience of a kind of brutal disciplinary form in their educational systems. Um, sometimes similar to educational systems for citizens, but often with even less um, of a chance to protest or reject or otherwise um, um, uh, ameliorate those uh, pedagogical and educational conditions. So that's one small example or, you know, of, of something that is sort of the central crucible of people's lives, which is um, education and how the Palestinian experience 
um, after the Nakba uh, shaped how the world thinks refugees and stateless communities should be educated, including Iraqis and Syrians and uh, Sudanese and others who have become dispossessed as a result of violence, war, invasion, occupation, authoritarianism and dictatorship in their own countries. Um, in addition, the Palestinian experience in terms, in real, you know, and I'm not a lawyer, so you'll have to excuse me, but, uh, you know, that, that there's one description of the Palestinians is that they are differentiated by international law, that there is a protection gap wherein um, other refugees are accorded rights that Palestinians are not in the international community. Um, they are exceptionalized by international law and therefore are not treated, for example, are not um, offered the same asylum or accorded the same asylum um, rights that UNHCR refugees are, uh, are. And there are specific political reasons for this difference, right? But it's to say that that difference does exist and it's had real consequences for the experience of Palestinians, for example, from Iraq um, or from Syria or from Lebanon in particular, who have had to you know, um, go into exile or Gaza, who have got to go into exile over and over and over again in the last 75 years of dispossession. Um, but I want to kind of um, just take this opportunity to talk about something. You know, today is the 75th anniversary of the Nakba, but it's nine, you know, 1948 is a, was a horrible year for many people. Um, it was at 47, 48. Um, in South Asia, in Africa, in uh, Europe, um, and elsewhere. What does it mean 75 years on for the Palestinians to almost singularly remain under a colonial context? This does not mean that the conditions elsewhere have gotten better. In fact, perhaps the authoritarian, the brutality of authoritarianism, of far-right fascism, of um, capitalist extraction elsewhere, has worsened as well, but it does mean something that the Palestinians remain under a colonial regime um, on top of its shared struggles um, against, um, you know, its shared struggles on all sorts of other issues, including um, racism, popular right-wing fascism um, and capitalism. So there's, um, you know, I, one thing that I always talk about um, is, you know, th that there are dangers to differentiating and often Palestinians are exceptionalized both positively and negatively in po political organizing and political discourse um, elsewhere. They are sometimes exceptionalized negatively. They're often generally exceptionalized negatively by, it, by either um, erased, as Palestinians in discussions of broader issues, or for example, war, um, refugees, displacement, dispossession, or so they are erased by silencing and they're also erased by um, uh, negation, by, by, by saying, you know, Palestinians are, uh, are, are, don't count because they're whatever, terrorist, anti-Semitic, blah, 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 blah. Um, there is also, this is the, the general condition, but there is also times when differentiation has exceptionalized Palestinians at the expense of other struggles. And this is something where Palestinians have taken quite a vociferous lead in rejecting that Palestinians see themselves in struggle and joint struggle with um, all sorts of movements that are calling for equality and justice and freedom in the world. And that it is, there is no, um, freedom for Palestinians that is dislodged or exceptionalized from or unique from um, other movements and struggles. They are co-constitutive to the end. And, um, um, and that insistence by Palestinians in their history is a commitment that you see repeated over and over and over again from the micro, micro scales of local communities and activism to the broader scale of the national movement. Um, both in you know the national movement and, and its kind of multiple iterations um, after Oslo. 
So I just kind of want to mark that that the Nakba has its exceptions, it has its makings, it has its mark, it has its shape, it has its life, it has its multiple histories and geographies and biography, but it is in a moment of cataclysm that is experienced by so many people in the world. And there is a deep political empathy that Palestinians have shared with those experiences elsewhere. Thank you. I uh, thank you uh, very much, uh, Dr. Kato, for this. Um, a lot of, of uh, uh, food for thought here. Uh, the um, uh, a point that you have raised about the the Palestinian being exiled over and over again. I think that kind of really sums up that kind of experience we are trying to highlight here. Is that maybe for some nations and for many nations, in fact, exile is a real thing. It's a historic event and it's a is a shattering event, but for Palestinians it seems to be an endless event. And those of us who have uh, worked on oral history for years, uh, they also understand this, that, uh, that you have Palestinians now in Syria who might have been exiled from Lebanon, who might have been exiled from Jordan, who might have originally go back to the Nakba and their grandfathers and great grandfathers and mothers. So there's the continuity of the Palestinian experience that gives it that kind of sense of uniqueness. But of course, there's you know, the rising awareness internationally to build the solidarity movement with the understanding that Palestine is still not the exception in that regard as well. I'm going to move on to my last speaker for today, uh, and that is Dr. Mahmoud Zidan. Uh, Dr. Zidan is a Palestinian refugee himself, born in Ain al-Hilwe, refugee camp in Lebanon. Uh, he's educated in, uh, uh, in education and a human rights specialist. He has gained extensive experience in oral history with Palestinian, Iraqi, and Syrian refugees. I think that's kind of quite interesting of how it ties up to the points raised by uh, Dr. Khatu as well. Uh, Dr. Uh, Zidan is the co-founded uh, co the yeah. Nakba Archive and Lens on Lebanon, a grassroots documentary initiative. And I was asked, by the way, by a colleague of Dr. Zidan, and that is uh, uh, our speaker who could not be with us today, uh, Dr. Diana Alan, who said, please, Ramzi, plug in the website. And I think uh, Mahmoud is going to be talking more about it. And that is uh, www.nakba-archive.org, that nakba-archive.org. So please check out the fantastic work they have done on oral history. My question to you, Dr. Zaidan, is quite often we see and hear people talking about the refugees without the actual voice or voices of those refugees being represented in the Nakba discourse themselves. Uh, uh, now, the question is, I want to believe personally that this is changing and that we are beginning to see the, the actual organic, original voice of the refugees taking a center stage in this discussion. Is oral history becoming a, a main source of information and content creation regarding the experience of the Palestinian refugees uh, and the overall meaning of the Nakba? The floor is yours. Yeah, thank you. Uh... Dr. Ramsey for the question and uh, let me start by thanking Pluto for organizing this and thanking the audience uh, and uh, I'm really sorry because Diana couldn't make it hopefully uh, we have other occasions to meet and talk. Uh, let me first uh, just uh, 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 highlight the issue of uh, ongoing or continuity of, of, of Nakba. I think what is going now on in Gaza, and and I myself, as you said, I Im I, I embody the uh, uh, ongoing Nakba. Being a refugee, is still like living in refugee camp and uh, seeking justice and and uh, uh, fighting and struggling for my right of return. This is really the essence of of uh, uh, ongoing Nakba. And then I will talk about significance, but going back to your question, yeah, I do really uh, uh, agree with you that the, the, uh, uh, the Nakba in itself is not merely the, the disposition and the destruction of homes and villages that is still happening now in Gaza and the deprivation of refugees to exercise their rights 
but the most difficult is silencing and erasing the memory and the history of Palestinian refugees. Because if you now go to any uh, historic documents or sometimes books in Europe, uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, most of them adopt the Zionist point of view or version of history. And uh, you rarely hear or find the uh, real history that took place 75 years ago, the history that we are talking about now. So the oral history, I think, is one of the tools that mm -hmm. empowered refugees to and gave voice to their suffering and to their question. So it, it, it is like it, it democratizes uh, uh, the, the, the uh, written history and it filled the gaps and it corrected the mainstream history. So I can here talk about the Nakba archive and I really encourage everyone to go and uh, uh, let's say navigate the website that is uh, rich with first-hand testimonies that uh, uh, covers uh, the social, political, and 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 uh, cultural history of Palestine before 1948. So while do, while going to refugees, I mean, like we managed to document unheard voices or uh, uh, unheard stories about massacres and about coexistence and about betrayal. And these moments that were like recorded in refugee camps in this gloomy uh, environment or atmosphere where the refugees are still waiting their rights uh, uh, and, and, and fighting to, to return to their homes and villages. I really like to quote here uh, because once uh, I think Akram mentioned about uh, refugees did not expect to, to commemorate 75 years of Nakba in exile. One of my interviewees told me from Ain al Helwi camp in the south, they used to bury their dead people in, in Bintish Bay, not in Saida. And when I asked him why going to the south, he said, because we were waiting like return and we expected that when we return, it will be closer for us to visit them after. So this, if you want, this uh, 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 belief or this hope did not faint among refugees. Yesterday I was in Ain al camp and today refugees commemorated the 75 years of Nakba. And I saw different uh, 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 parades from the times that I uh, uh, used to see in the past when I was young we used to see like uh, uh, military parades. I used to participate in scout parades and in other like uh, uh, forms of uh, contribution or engagement at all levels in the community. Yesterday, I saw how the Palestinian refugees in Ain al Helwi camp, among a lot of racist and 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 let's say uh, inhuman laws and the practices and uh, 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 fighting to have dignified life and at the same time fighting and struggling to uh, uh, keep, let's say, the cause alive and in order to uh, seek justice and ensure return. I think now, uh, 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 going back to the positive side, uh, uh, the Nakba archive and uh, our cooperation with the Pluto Press is a good example. The book that Diana uh, published with uh, Pluto last year, Voices of Nakba, is a good example how we can use oral history and uh, give a, a, a kind of justice for the Palestinian refugees, or the, not only the first generation, but also for the uh, young generation now in the camps, who have this legacy of this position, and they are still fighting in order to achieve justice. And the uh, Nakba Archive now started a very promising project to convert much and many of the stuff there, like interviews, to be used in schools and for education, how teachers can uh, 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 use the interviews in classroom 
and we have other uh, uh, activities and projects where we produce stories for children and uh, we organize uh, creative writing workshops with young people in, in the camps. I think these examples are very significant, especially now on the uh, 75th commemoration of Nakba, to say that Palestinians are there, they will not give up, and they are fighting until justice is achieved and the right over them is achieved. Uh, I hope I, I answered your question, but I will be open for more Q&As at, at the end. Thank you. You have, and, and thank you very much, uh, Dr. Zidane, for this. Um, and, and yes, indeed, we are going to come back and, and ask a few questions here. And uh, we, have, we have a good amount of time left. I'm just going to start with Akram because we have a, a pinpointed question uh, to Dr. Uh, Akram coming from Haifa um, Rashid. Uh, Haifa asks, says, Akram, you say that Palestinians will never give up on the right of return, yet the Palestinian Authority was reportedly prepared to do that to some extent. How can we achieve justice when the leadership undermines us? Yeah, thank you, Haifa. I, um, yeah, I think this question, it, it goes back to the point I was trying to highlight about what the Nakba means. And I think, uh, you know, Mahmoud reinforces as well by saying that it's not only, of course, it is about, but it's not only about the houses and the lands and the villages and everything else. It's also about the destruction of entire society. And if you begin to think about your own life and what comprises uh, what it means to be a society, what it means to be a nation, uh, and what it means to have all of that destroyed, um, the profundity and the enormity of what happened to Palestinians uh, during the Nakba can be properly comprehended and understood. But of course, a lot of the groundwork for the Nakba was, was set in place by the British, who worked during the Great Arab Revolt to destroy Palestinian unity and through a long list of brutal measures of counterinsurgency, co uh, collective punishment, uh, and so forth, uh, assassinations, and of course, uh, bringing in and using divide and rule tactics to destroy Palestinian unity in what was an enormous, epic, heroic struggle of Palestinians for three years during the um, Arab Revolt. The purpose of them doing that was to destroy Palestinian unity. And what the Nakba did was continue and exacerbate that, pro uh, that process by adding to the political fragmentation and division the geographical dispersion across the region and across the world. And the Palestinian response to that was to try and find a measure of unity and representation and ensure that the voice of, you know, we use this term voice a lot and we need to think, be careful sometimes of what it means, not just the voice, but the active participation of Palestinians on a mass scale in revolutionary activity in order to counter the um, colonial imposition of uh, the Israeli state upon them. And the job of Palestinians is also is always to make sure that we have a, a, an inclusive democratic movement that brings as many Palestinians together as possible in order to fight this fight collectively and together. And to get in to work with and engage our Arab brethren, people uh, around the world, movements of liberation with whom we worked in the past and whom presumably we will work again. Now, of course, the current Palestinian leadership in that formulation is not representative by any uh, understanding of the term. And there have been long-standing attempts by Palestinians to reclaim Palestinian national institutions through elections to the Palestinian National Council, through the rebuilding of our popular unions. And I think that's what Palestinians need to do. This, the, the, the fate of Palestine is not, it is not now, and it has never been, uh, the plaything of small individuals and a leadership. The leadership has only ever had any meaning by the mass popular movements that have they have supported to build or that have accompanied them. And I think that we're in that same situation now. If we remove the most corrupt officials from the PA and put in other people, it would still be a corrupt institution. We need a representative institution of Palestinians that includes all Palestinians on an equal basis 
all around the world. And when we have that national movement, you will see that the right of return goes right to the top of the list of demands again. In the absence of that, we're going to get all kinds of um, strange priorities of our national movement. Excellent. Thank you very much for addressing that uh, point. Uh, Akram, my next question is to uh, uh, Dr. Karmi. Uh, we spoke in, in, in positive terms about the change that is underway uh, in, in various academic institutions uh, in, in, in the West and around the world. But I think it's also important to try to highlight what is it that we have done right now that is making that change take place, or maybe what the pro-Israeli camp and the Zionists have done wrong. Why is this change happening now and it didn't happen before? Yeah, it's a good question. Look, this is an, uh, a cumulative process. It, it isn't really any one thing. Uh, it's uh, many, many years of building bricks by uh, people uh, trying their best to write, to analyze, to publish. Um, secondly, uh, and very importantly, this, is, this academic process has been accompanied by um, active resistance on the part of, uh, in particular, the people of Gaza. And I absolutely want to give tribute here to Gaza because it, uh, singly has had the most powerful effect on public opinion in the West. Um, I know that if you look at certain opinion polls that were done in the aftermath of each Israeli assault on Gaza, you have a spike in um, support for the Palestinians. Uh, it's tragic to say this, but the sacrifice through their bodies and their blood of the people of Gaza has been probably the, one of the most effective um, factors in creating Western support. Um, so, so all in all, we have to consider that it's a phenomenon really, the, 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 the way that the Palestinian people have behaved in, in terms of their manifold ways in which they have carried out their resistance, whether it's through writing, through academic teaching, through uh, actual action on the ground in, against the Israelis, through um, public speaking, through so many ways in which they have all worked together, not consciously, but it has had the same effect as if they had all made a master plan uh, and worked together. I think that's really what, what's done it and we'll, we'll, and we'll go on doing it until we get our, our rights. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Karmi, for this. Uh, my next question is to uh, Dr. Katu. Um, it's not easy teaching uh, issues pertaining to the refugees, the Nakba, Palestine in general, in an environment that has been kind of purposely shut down in the face of that kind of knowledge throughout the years. It's a systematic process that has put Palestinians, as you said, the, the negation of the Palestinian. The Palest so there's a process of unlearning and, and, and relearning uh, involved in this. As an education specialist, how do we teach the Nakba and refugees it, specifically in this kind of society um, in a sustainable way, not just through a single conference or a webinar, but in a sustainable way? I mean, I, I don't have a prescription for you. I think that, but I think that there's ways that Palestine has to be part of many different kinds of uh, pedagogical projects. Um, and experience and 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 spaces, educational spaces. 
Um, I think that's part of what becomes the exceptionalism and its dangers that I described, where you would have, you know, a unit on Palestine that can, you know, that's often an add-on, depending upon the willingness of the teacher or educator to take on the kind of challenges um, we're currently experiencing in the UK in particular, but in the US and uh, in Germany, for example, as well. Um, so, you know, the for, for me, I think the important thing is to tell the Palestine story in many different ways with many different narrators and to reject a kind of singular approach to the Palestine story. Um, and in particular, the story of the Nakba. Um, so that's one kind of relation to a pedagogical project on Palestine that I think is really important. But I think it's also really important to think of Palestine as a place from which we can understand other experiences, that Palestine has a lot to offer as an experience in many different ways, in terms of dispossession, displacement, but also in terms of struggle, in terms of pedagogy, in terms of experimentation, in terms of creativity, art, theory, thought, um, politics, um, political organization, popular mobilization, trade unionization, um, wild strikes, um, the most important of which is happening actually in Palestine now with a teacher's union, with the teachers who are challenging their union for, um, in their struggle for, you know, basic demands. Um, so there, you know, I, I think it's about placing Palestine in this world and horizon of, of multiple projects and multiple uh, voices and, and spaces, um, not just one. There is, for me, I'm not particularly interested in the Western audience per se. I'm interested in audiences who share a, the sensibility of Palestine, which is a sensibility that demands justice where, wherever it is being denied and equality wherever it's being denied. I'm, I'm absolutely interested in uh, bringing the question of Palestine to an India that is experiencing the rise of brutal, um, brutal far-right politics or Palestine in conversation with the Kurdish struggle or and, and, and a different voice of Palestine and a challenge to certain discourses of Palestine, for example, in Turkey now. Um, or in the Arab world, there is a hunger, a deep hunger across the Arab world uh, of young people who deeply desire to understand Palestine differently. And I think we have to think of the Palestine um, struggle as one that is embedded regionally and in a way that the pedagogical project needs to come closer home um, to, for example, Egypt or Iraq or um, the Gulf. <laughs> Um, and that this is a project that Palestinians themselves must take on, but also people in the region must take on. Um, and to be very frank, I think that the pedagogical project around the Nakba requires also us to educate young Palestinians who, as a result of an absolutely decrepit, diseased leadership, has excised the Nakba from um, substantively from the education of Palestinian young people, especially in the West Bank, but also Palestinian young people um, in the refugee camps across the region and in 48 and in Gaza. Um, so Palestinian young people need to learn about the Nakba too. Thank you very much uh, for this, uh, Dr. Kato. Uh, just an image that um, just popped in my head right now is uh, I think of Hajar, the, the nine-year-old Palestinian girl who was killed in, uh, in Gaza in the last few days. And uh, it's, uh, it's a very famous picture of her that's been viewed by millions where she is standing with a sign that says, we will return to Palestine. And I thought, um, you know, just how incredible it is as if she was trying to send us a message just before the Nakba, something to keep in mind uh, just before she was killed uh, by Israel. Moving on to uh, Dr. Zidane, uh, the situation for Palestinian refugees in South Lebanon, in Lebanon in general, is not very good. We know that we we have been following the news for for some time, and we know you know the extensive research that 
people like you and other scholars in Lebanon have done shows how Palestinians are marginalized and alienated within their societies in Lebanon after all these years of the Nakba. And now we also know that uh, that many, uh, can you hear there, me okay? There, no, there was little disconnection. Would you please repeat? Uh, oh, absolutely. Sorry, so what you... I was saying is the situation for Palestinian refugees in South Lebanon and Lebanon in general is quite harsh. They are denied jobs, opportunities. And we also know, though sometimes we try to deny that, that there's been some sort of a slow exodus of Palestinians out of South Lebanon. Um, the roots of this could be many, but they also include the fact that the Palestinian leadership itself has decided to marginalize the Palestinian refugee cause and the right of return as an issue that is to be left to the so-called final status negotiations, which never really took place in the first place. So how do we empower our communities, the communities of Palestinian refugees in South Lebanon, to remain a solid, strong, collective uh, 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 group that is pushing for the right of return, considering all of these circumstances? Yeah, as thank you again for the question. And I, I think, I, as I said, like the significance of the Nakba is uh, uh, having its impact not only on Palestinians, but on the region and on the world politics. And definitely Lebanon is a small country that has been burdened by this long exile. And uh, uh, we as Palestinians, we understand the, 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 the burden or as I said, the heavy presence of any community uh, uh, to be hosted for another small community for this long time. And now with the Syrian crisis, again, this is uh, uh, overburdening the Lebanese uh, uh, community, if you want, uh, uh, more and more. But uh, <clears throat> again, as I said, we need to understand the, uh, the, the first sin or the first, if you want, uh, mistake. That is the expulsion, the Nakba, the, the expulsion of Palestinian refugee. Now, before like uh, 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 talking about Lebanon, I want now to uh, uh, go to the root causes of the uh, Nakba. And the basic right of Palestinian refugees is to go back to their homes and villages. If this has been achieved, I don't think you will have all these repercussions of human rights violations or deprivations, or as I said, like uh, discriminatory practices or laws against Palestinians in host governments, whether in Lebanon or in, I don't know uh, how the situation is in Egypt or in Iraq or wherever. The main uh, cause or the root cause of the uh, 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 Nakba started by Israel. And Israel's, if you want, ideology, Zionist ideology. And if you want strategy that hasn't changed, is to change realities and ask you to go and solve the new realities or deal with the new challenges and realities. So they replaced my parents and my people by immigrants. And then they ask you, what should we do with these newly born or new immigrants that came and lived or uh, uh, let's say uh, uh, settled in this house or in this village? It's not my mistake. It's not my worry to, to again, the, the main problem, did you ask yourself uh, uh, when you uprooted a uh, whole people that were living in these houses and these villages? I mean, like, we are always trying to, uh, 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 let's say, to treat the consequences or the uh, secondary results or secondary, uh, 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 if you want, mistakes, if I want to say. Mm -hmm. Now, this doesn't mean that Lebanon is uh, not to be blamed or uh, uh, doesn't have obligations. It's it's like legal and moral obligation because I am not a tourist here and I did not choose to come here. So Lebanon has also to, uh, uh, let's say, respect 
its obligation in international law and the human rights conventions to give Palestinians their civil rights until they return. So now, now some it's a political issue. It's not like this is the problem. Like uh, 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 the, the, the cause is political uh, because of the Palestinian uh, crisis is political. And unfortunately, the treatment now uh, in Lebanon is political because some politicians think you need to keep refugees deprived and like uh, 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 being marginalized in order to ensure or protect their right of return. My, uh, 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 I mean, my uh, argument is despite the marginalization and despite the deprivation of basic rights, Palestinian refugees are still upholding the right of return. It's not because, it's despite. So empowering Palestinian refugees on the first place is giving them the rights in host governments and on top in Lebanon so that they can really work and have the time to struggle for their basic right, the right of return. And again, this is a very important point for like the international uh, uh, organizations and uh, world powers to play a real role. Like instead of going into endless negotiations that didn't lead anywhere instead of confining the leadership because this is another manifestation of the nakba is to not only uh, 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 disempower you it's like to embarrass you and to destroy and dis, uh, dismantle any uh, 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 structure of leadership in the palestinian community whether in the camp, whether in PA, whether in, let's say, uh, 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 the diaspora or, or uh, all uh, exile, that Israel doesn't want Palestinians to be settled and to be focused in order to struggle for their right of return. They have to be always busy, busy, either in internal affairs or running for bits of living instead of being focused for their basic right, the right of living. Thank you. Thank you for that, Dr. Zidane. Um, we have um, less than 10 minutes and we have a question, but uh, I was really hoping that we could end at a positive note. Um, although a lot of positive things have been said and a lot of promising things have been communicated, if we could um, very quickly, if each one of us can have like about a minute or so, a minute and a half to answer, or just to leave us with something to think about what makes you hopeful uh, for the future, the future of, of uh, the Palestinian right of return and Palestine in general, one and a half minute with Dr. Khatu in particular, uh, someone is asking, is there any particular or specific curriculum we can adopt to teach Palestinians in Western um, countries? So if you could add that to your points, uh, and let's start with uh, Dr. Karmi as usual. Um, I think that we have to think in terms of what do we do about it? Because, uh, you know, I'm older than other people uh, on this panel, and I can tell you decades of my life have been spent um, analyzing, looking at the present, looking at the past, we need to look to the future. That is the one thing that's going to help us. In my own case, I've written a book, which is just out, Pluto Press has published it, called One State, The Only Democratic Future for Palestine and Israel. And that is something I really believe. We need to work towards the creation of one state to replace the current Israeli state and its policies. And we must work for that. That's what I'm hoping for. Uh, thank you very much for, for this. And also thank you for the tremendous work that you have done throughout the years, Dr. Karmi. You have been uh, an intellectual leader to so many of us, and you will continue to serve this role for many years to come, inshallah. Um, Akram? Yeah, I think... Uh... The point for me is the point that uh, Haifa's question so nicely set up. 
which is that uh, you know the, there's no lack of vision amongst Palestinians about the kind of society we could build, the kinds of arrangements we could make um, in in a future uh, society. But the question for us now is how do we get there? And I think how we get there is by rebuilding our political structures so that everyone is able to have uh, to be equally included and play a part in that struggle. And if you read our history and the history of other nations who struggled against colonialism, you see that there are ups and there are downs. There are uh, changes from the past. There are adaptations. There's learning from the struggles of previous generations, the strategies they adopted. There's accounting for the differences that we have today. But throughout all of that, I'm always struck by the immensity of the struggle uh, of the spirit of the Palestinian people who've struggled for their rights against the most extraordinary odds and the finding common cause with people who've be been in these terrible circumstances as well and finding not just a common suffering, but a common struggle in confronting that. And I know that although this moment is one of great pain, when we, when we know that the, when we see all around us the impact of Israel's apartheid regime, the bombing of Gaza and everything we've seen this past week alone, that it can seem, um, uh, you know, somewhat depressing, but the Palestinians have not surrendered anything and the struggle continues and the struggle for us internally is to find a way now to manifest manifest that extraordinary political will in political structures that can give force and give meaning to our people's demands and can reach out to our allies across the world and i i think that's what we will see happening sooner rather than later thank you thank you very much uh, dr salha for your contributions for your scholarship and uh, for um, addressing this particular question. And uh, uh, we'll move to uh, Dr. Nkatu with the question, that additional specific question that one of our listeners have for her. Dr. Nkatu. Um, thank you so much, uh, Ramzi. So I'm often more of a pessimist, I guess, in my disposition around some of these things. So I do wanna say that I, as a historian maybe, um, and when we look at the multiple dispossessions that have happened in, in the last 75 years, not just in 1948, but entire communities of Palestinians who have been erased and decimated across the region. Um, sometimes I fall into a bit of pessimism and a sense that, you know, people disappear, people are erased, um, peoplehoods um, go extinct. What pulls me back from that precipice as an peso optimist in the great Emil Habibi tradition is precisely the stubborn will of Palestinians to keep moving and particularly young people. Um, and that kind of intergenerational transfer of knowledge and experience and um, will and hope and practice and resoluteness um, under unbearable unbearable cruelties, small and large, you know, drones and bombs um, and all sorts of silences and, you know, get children, children woke up in 1948, May 15th, 1948, being told in May 14th that they had a country, they put their head on a pillow and woke up and told they do not exist. And we have spent the last 75 years proving that we do. Um, that's an extraordinary achievement and accomplishment. And it's one that um, is not, never, you know, is not often recognized as such, but it's also one that has had its own cruelties. 75 years of a people trying to prove that they exist is a hell of a lot of time spent trying to, you know, establish a very basic kind of absurd fact. Um, but you have young people who are moving on and they're doing other things and they're doing incredible work. Um, and they're rejecting this demand to prove anything about their very existence. 
They have other questions that they're in, that, that they're interested in. They're grateful for the generations before them that have said otherwise, you know, that have laid the path for them, but they have they have new projects in the works. And I think that's incredibly hopeful and powerful. Um, and it is the one mitigation against extinction as a people. Um, in terms of curriculum, one of the things that, you know, uh, sometimes I talk is that there is none. There, there have been attempts historically to create a curriculum for Palestinians or on Palestine um, internationally and globally. And there have been multiple educational efforts um, that still exist that are really powerful, oral histories, uh, pedagogical experience on the um, Palestinian revolution, for example, or on the Nakba. But one singular thing, no. There's barely any histories, you know, for general audiences about Palestine that I would regard as teachable. <laughs> so there's still a lot of work to be done. And there's a lot of work that scholars and activists and organizers, both Palestinian and for Palestine have to do and need to get um, cracking on. Um, and one of them is to think more systemically about this question of curriculum. And, you know, there's, there's Palestinian radical teachers that have questions about the concept of a curriculum, and I think we need to incorporate that as well. Um, but there's a lot to do and a lot to look forward to doing in the years, and uh, hopefully it won't take another 75 before we move on to another phase of Palestinian history. I thank you very much, Dr. Khatou, for your contributions and, and all the work that you continue to do. Perhaps a good starting point is uh, is for our listeners to look at the uh, impressive archive of Pluto Press, uh, many great books on history, oral history, uh, um, political analysis regarding Palestines, and that could in fact be uh, a very, very solid foundation and a starting point. We are gonna move uh, on with one minute, forgive me, Dr. Zidane, uh, for being slightly unfair to you, but we only have one minute for your final thoughts. What keeps you going? Uh, and give us a source of optimism regarding the Nakba. Yeah, in one minute, Nakba remains like a powerful symbol of Palestinian resilience and resistance. And its ongoing presence in Palestine uh, serves as a reminder of the ongoing struggle for justice and peace in the region. We started maybe alone, but now I think with social media, with this important event that Pluto has been uh, has organized. I think we're not alone. Uh, I just want to end with a, a sentence from one of my elder interviewees. He told me I left alone Palestine in 1948, and now I I wanted to return. And he said I will die, but I left 130 grandchildren who want to return, and I think this is the hope. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Indeed, we are not alone. And inshallah, we will never be alone again. Uh, the Nakba is an all-encompassing Palestinian story of the past, present, and future. It's not only a story of victimization, but also a story of Palestinian sumud, steadfastness, and resistance. It is the single most unifying platform that brings all Palestinians together beyond the restrictions of factions, politics, or geography. The Nakba has come to define the collective Palestinian identity. I thank all of you for your fantastic contributions. Chris, Alex, Pluto Press family, thank you for everything that you do for Palestine and to give a platform to Palestinian voices as you do today, as you have always done throughout the years. Thanks to all of those who have joined us for your questions and, and for continuing your own fights in your own way as well. Thanks so much for tuning in and hope to see you all soon.